take somebody's hand beside of you, just somebody's hand beside of you, wherever you're standing. I want you to pray for that person. And the specific prayer I need you to pray is that they would not allow the devil to lie to them and cause them to doubt God's purpose. That's what I need you to pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each person. As we are gathered hand in hand, heart in heart today as we're praying up to you, I pray that as the devil tries to lie to each one of us, to try to get us to quit, to stop, to give up, to think that God's not in control, to thinking that he's not faithful, we speak to the lies of the enemy. And we say to the devil, you're a liar, and you come to do nothing but steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came so that we could have life, and that we could have abundant life. I pray for each person today, God, that you would just renew their minds. Rain down on them today in a new way. Lord, refresh our minds. Refresh our hearts. Don't allow us to become distracted. Don't allow us to become discouraged. I pray that the spirit of depression that is trying to overcome your people, I pray that the, the, the spirit of depression would leave in the name of Jesus. That as that depressing spirit comes to cause us to fail or to stop, we pray that it would be cast out through all peace and strength in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know that you're in control, God, and we don't doubt who you are, and we don't doubt who you want us to become. We love you today. We love you today. You're a faithful God. Look with me up on the screen. Let me give you a, how perfect will this be. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Uh, now to him who is able, don't you love that phrase? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask. Or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I want to stop and tell you one thing that the glory of the Lord didn't depart when the Bible stopped being written. That the same God that was in the Old Testament parting the waters, shutting the lion's mouth. The same God that was in the New Testament, that walked on the water, that healed the blinded eyes, that raised the dead to life. The same God that saved your soul. The same God that can do anything that you can think or imagine is in this place today. And that same God wants to take your life and your family and your problems. He wants to show you another level of them. If, if God can do anything that we ask and above that, then why do we ask for something so small when He can do something so big? So the title today of my message is, God Has No limits. I'm going to say it again. God has no limits. The God that you serve and I serve, He has no limitations. But if I could subtitle it, I would say, then why do we limit Him? If He has no limits, then why do we act as if He does? And today I want to squash the why. And let's turn it into, God, you can do anything. God, you can do everything. 
And I'm going to walk in that today. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Man, isn't it good to be here today? Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah? If you're a first-time guest with us, we are so thankful that you're here. Let's give all our first-time guests a big hand today. We're so thankful you're here. we got people finally coming back from vacation a little bit at a time, so maybe in a couple of weeks everybody will decide to be Christians again and come back. I'm just kidding. Hey, if you got to go out of town on vacation, you deserve it. You need to take time to go on vacation. Um, but man, I'm glad to be in church today. I, I, I will say, if you're a first-time guest today, there's a couple things I want you to know. And the first thing is that in this church, Remedy Church, we believe in worship. And, and we believe that the power of God exists in our lives and that the Holy Spirit can work through our lives. Um, we believe in lifting our hands and clapping. We believe in going, woo, when we feel the Spirit sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we're in the Spirit. Um, the second thing I want you to know if you're a first-time guest is we'd love for you to fill out one of our Connect cards. It comes with a hassle-free guarantee. We will not hassle you. We will not show up at your door. We will not call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. We just simply want to send you information about our church. And we also have a special gift for you. We have a nice Remedy t-shirt. Is anybody wearing a Remedy shirt today? We got a gray one right here with red on it. Has anybody got a black one on? Hey, I got one right here. Stand up, Bill. Oh, yeah, black with a blue on it. Praise the Lord. That's the one you'll be receiving if you're a first-time guest with us. So please fill out the information. On the way out, you can give it to one of our greeters. We'd love to get you a t-shirt so that you can sport it around town with your Jordans. All right, if you don't have Jordans, you can wear your flip-flops. But we want you to, to do that. It's okay to smile in church. Well, I'm serious now, man. I feel the Lord. You can still smile for the Lord. Remember last week, I got the joy in my heart. I got the joy in my heart. I do want to say one other thing, and then I'll get into the message today because I'm so excited to preach this. I can't hardly stand it. Thank you um, from Melissa and I for all of what you've done yesterday for us and our little daughter to be coming um, whenever she wants to come, whenever God tells her to come, you come. And um, it was interesting because uh, Friday we went to the doctor's office and Melissa's laid out on the um, thing, the, the, yeah, the sticky thing, you know what I mean. And it's got the paper and the stuff. And, and she's laid out, and, and the doctor walks over, and he measures her stomach. And he said, man, you're doing good. Everything's great. You know, and I'm sitting in a little chair. And all I can see is Melissa's ponytail because I'm behind her. And uh, he goes, he goes, let me, and this guy's like, he's probably 50 or 60 years old. And you can just tell he's done a long time. He's real smart and intelligent. And I, I can't call him out on YouTube just because... I don't know if I can do that, so I might get in trouble. But he's a great doctor. So anyway, he goes over and he, he goes, hey, would you like to, let me see where this baby's laying at. This dude, no ultrasound, nothing, walks over and goes, hmm, puts his hand, hmm, I feel the butt. I'm sorry, the bottom. Like you don't say to me. And then he felt down and he goes, I feel the little hand. And he's pushing pushing. I'm like, hey man, don't squash it. Like, you know, just feel it if you want to feel it. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Hudson, would you like to come feel? He says, yeah, man, I'll go over there and feel. So I put my hand over there. He goes, do you feel that? I said, yeah. He goes, that's the butt, the bottom, for some of you that don't believe in the other word. And he said, you can push down right there and you can feel the head. And I said, I do feel the head. That's great, man. And then I left and, you know, I, I tried to do it at home and I didn't get the same response. I don't know if it was the bed or... But the reason I told you that story is something that God spoke to me. It's not about my message, but it was specifically that day that just as the doctor knew exactly where that baby was placed, God knows where you're placed. He knows if you're upside down. He knows if you're sideways. 
He knows if you're struggling. He knows if you're hurting. And it didn't take him by surprise. He doesn't need an ultrasound to see what you're going through. He knows you. He knows you. But thank you again for everything you did yesterday. All the, the gifts. Um, I thank you for um, just showing your love to Melissa and I through, through the gifts. And if you had to leave early and we weren't able to open your present before you left, thank you so much for that. Thank you for the gifts that we've gotten today. And um, we're just we're so thankful and blessed. Again, we are baby stupid. So everything you helped us with helped a lot. And, and, and there was a trash can that looked like a basketball goal, and there was a Duke backboard on the back of that thing. And when I got home, and when I got home, my mom said, won't you, won't you take that off and put a Carolina backboard on there? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And she said, why? I said, because this trash can with that backboard is made perfect for poopy diapers. The Dookie backboard is great, man. I appreciate that. That was good. That was great. I don't think you expected me to turn it like that, but it was, it was, it was great. But thank you so much. We appreciate, appreciate you guys so much. God has no limits. You believe that? You believe that? I guess the, the challenge I want to give you today is, is if if we believe that God has no limits, then why don't we live like He does? You know, why don't we pray like He's got no limits? You know, why don't why don't when we pray for somebody to be healed, we actually believe and know they can be healed instead of just thinking they can be healed? God has no limits today. I do want to talk about how awesome God is today. I do want to express how awesome God is. I do, I do. But I also want to tell you that we will never experience God the way we want to experience Him as long as we're viewing Him through only our human life scope. Because if we're only viewing Him through the flesh, we'll never see Him through the Spirit. Spiritually, thinking God is much bigger than we can even perceive. The Bible said that He does immeasurably more than we can think or imagine. The flip to it is that, that when we look at Him through our own scope of life, we start to see something small. We see God through a small scope because our human scope makes things look smaller because we can't perceive how big God really is. And so when we talk about God as new limits, I think the reason that sometimes that, that we do what we do is because we expect less of God, not meaning to, because of what we've heard or seen in our life. For example... I could get up here and, and tell you about all these miracles in the Bible, and we would be hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, and glory to God, and, and I could tell you about all the miracles in the Bible. I could tell you that there were miracles that Jesus did that's not recorded in the Bible. And we could, we could really, we, we could, I could just preach on that alone, and we could, we could go home and feel really good about the Lord. And, but then there's the flip side of it. So when's the last time that you went out to the lake and saw the water part down the middle? When's the last time somebody had to go in a den of lions and because they didn't do what was told for them to do and, and an angel, we hear about it, an angel shut the lion's mouth. I've never heard of that except one time. When's the last time you went to the ocean and instead of having to ride the buggy board, you just walked on the waves? Now, I thought I'd done that one time when I seen a shark. When's the last time you prayed for somebody who was blind and then they walked away seeing? See, the reason that we've gotten to a point in our minds the way that we have, and just stay with me because I'm going to go a little bit deeper, is because the view of God has been minimized by our scope of life. We, we have it seen the miracles and experienced the things that we've read about in the Bible. And so we judge God according to our society versus what we know Him to be able to do. Biblically. Spiritually. Can I tell you that the greatest miracle you'll ever experience in your life is not necessarily that if you were, say, physically blind 
and God restored your sight. Now, that would be amazing. And I would love to see that. i got an uncle that's blind, and I would love for him to regain sight. But the greatest miracle that ever happened to you is that you were dead and lost in your sin. You didn't have a hope or a future, but his blood cleansed you and made you white as snow, and now you have life. Yeah? Because the reason I want to tell you that is because only the blood of Jesus, the red blood of Jesus, could touch a black heart, a black soul, and make it white as snow. Only his blood. Only His blood. And so if you want to talk about miracles, then I would say that's probably a pretty powerful miracle. I would say that's probably something that you, you think in your mind that, wow, Jesus forgave me of all my sins that's ever been, that I've ever committed and that's ever been done. We read about the incredible things. We live in a society that puts limitations on God Himself. and People are using their own knowledge and relying on practic- practicality instead of their faith. If I were to tell someone that they had a disease and, and, and say, hey, you, you've got a disease and you're dying, but Jesus can heal you. Now, they may believe what I'm saying, but do they believe that God can? You see what I mean? It's one thing to believe in what someone says, but are you believing in what God can do? And there are some people that they'll believe and they'll hear what you're saying to them. And you can, you can tell them, this is like you can tell somebody they can be forgiven of all their sins. But when they logically begin to think about all the sins they've ever committed, they don't understand how that they can do all these things wrong and that Jesus still loves them anyway because everybody else has kicked them out of their lives. They can't understand how anybody would love them beyond their faults. So, let me, let me start by saying in, in reference to the Scripture that, that we say, That when it says that He's able to do more than we think, that means we will never comprehend what He can do. And by trying to comprehend what He can do, we limit what He does. That's deep. Let me say it again. And put it a little bit plainer. If we only think God can do what we can perceive Him to do, then we'll never comprehend how big God is. Because logically, in our own thinking, when we think about how, God, how big God is, we'll never understand how big God is. If we logically think about God's healing power, we'll never truly comprehend His true healing power. Because in our minds, we can't comprehend. The Bible says that He will do immeasurably above and beyond, go to, to greater heights and, and depths than what we can even imagine what He can do. So why can't try to comprehend it? Just receive it. You don't have to accept if he can. Just, just, well, God, I can't understand if you can heal my brother or not. I don't understand how you can do that. You don't have to comprehend it. Just say, God, I know you can. You don't have to perceive it. It doesn't have to make sense to you. The fact that Jesus came and died for you and me makes no sense to me. We don't deserve his blood. We didn't deserve anything. But the fact that he came, I don't have to, I don't have to understand it. I just accept him. Yeah? I'm about to get into this a little bit deeper. Look with me at the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro and his, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire within a bush. There was a burning bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never saw that happen in my life. Any old bush I put on fire burned up pretty quick. Even somebody didn't mean to put on fire. So, I said that out loud. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. Again, I'll repeat myself. Anytime you see something twice in a row, it means covenant. There was a covenant that was already being made. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here am I. Do not come any closer, God said. I love this. Take off your sandals. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. 
I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hivites. I love these words. Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Israel, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses, here's the key. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? There was an old song years ago that said, Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? I love that song. It's a good song. It's so true. In this circumstance, though, I'm not going to use it that same way. God had spoke to Moses to do something, and Moses' response was not, I'll do it, God, whatever you need me to do. Moses' response was, who am I, God, to be able to do that? In essence, what Moses is doing is limiting God by saying, you're not able to use me because of who I am. And our limitations that we put on God sometimes are not actually that we're limiting Him, but we're limiting His ability to use us. And so we look at ourselves and we say, God, how can I be used? And, and, and God, how can, you, how can you talk to me? And how can you do something for me? And, and, and I don't understand. And I hear this question a lot. I've been asked this a lot. Well, how can God use someone like me? And my answer back to them is, why can't He use somebody like you? Because if we're going to look at our worthiness, and we're going to look at whether we're godly enough, if we're holy enough to be used by God, then none of us qualify for His, for his qualifications. None of us. Well, you don't, you don't know what I've done in my past. Well, no, I don't. But if you've asked forgiveness for it, God said He cast it as far as east as to the west. He's not thinking about it either. Well, you don't know what that person, you don't know God can't use them. Well, I'm glad nobody said that about me because because if I were to listen to everybody that said God couldn't use me, then I wouldn't be standing behind this pulpit today. Well, you don't understand what I've done and you don't know what I've been through and you don't, you don't this and you. And, and I hear these things and I just want to say that when you say that and you say, who am I, God, and am I worthy enough to be used, what you're telling God is, God, you're not big enough to use somebody like me. You're limiting what God can do through you by your scope of yourself. God cannot, He, he, he doesn't look at you and, and say, well, well, you're just a too bad of a person for me to use. God can use a donkey to talk to somebody. He did it. <laughs> and if He can use a donkey, if he, can, he how many times in the Bible, and I wish I had time to preach all this today, but I don't, how many times in the Bible did He touch somebody who was a sinner before He actually healed them? As far as I can tell, it happened a lot of times. And, 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 and when, when Moses said, who am I, God, and who, who am I to be, to be used by you, We're, we are limiting what God can do through us. It's almost, like, it's almost like we're saying, Jesus, your blood wasn't good enough to cover my sins and blot out my problems. Your, your blood really isn't good enough, and God, and God, your strength just isn't going to be big enough to outweigh my weaknesses. That's what we tell him. Now, some of you are saying, well, we've got to be humble. Yeah, we do got to be humble. But humbleness is not minimizing God's ability. Being humble just says, it's not me, God, it's you. <laughs> it's not me, God, it's you. I can't do this by myself. That's being humble. That's giving glory to God. It's, it's saying that anything that you do through me, God, I want you to get the glory, not me. So if, so watch this. So if I lay my hands on somebody and, and they and they get saved, or if I lay my hands on somebody and they are healed, if I lay my hands on somebody and they have cancer and now they recover, which can happen, by the way, I believe that with all my heart, that cancer is not something God can't heal. Cancer is something that God wants to heal and, and disease, and, and I could go through the whole thing. But if I lay my hand on somebody and they're healed, I don't want nobody to say, well, look at old Pastor Ricky, man. I'll tell you right now, boy, he's got the power in him. No, 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 no. I don't have no power within myself. If I I prayed it was just Him using me to do something. It was Him transferring something through me. It's not me. It's all Him. 
I don't get up here every week and study all week long and preach my opinion. I preach the Word of God every week. I'm not going to give you my opinion. You know why? Because if I give you my opinion, it can't take you anywhere. But the Word of God will never, ever, ever, ever let you down. And the Word of God's going to stand when opinions go out the door. So, what are we talking about here? We're talking about you and I measuring God's ability through us. And when we do that, we're going to we're gonna min- minimize Him. <laughs> Growing up in the South. <laughs> oh, boy. Y'all not going to like me. I'll tell you anyway. Growing up in the South, we have this Bible Belt mentality, which I love growing up in the South, by the way. I love the South. I love us still, folks. I'm sorry. I love y'all too. I love y'all too. If you're from the North, we love y'all too. You know what I mean? We love you. We love you. You talk kind of funny, but we love you. We love you anyway. You know what I mean? We love you anyway. We love you anyway. It's funny because I got to say this right. First time I met Paul when I first came here, I could, I mean, immediately I could. I called him on the phone. He's like, hey, is this, is this my new pastor? And I said, yeah. I said, hey, man. So I, I, immediately I knew he was from up north. And, and the, one of the first conversations we had was he said, I said y'all or something like that. And, and uh, he just kind of chuckled a little bit. And uh, this is what he said, though. He didn't down me. He goes, I just need to learn how to say y'all like y'all do. <laughs> southern folk. Uh, and if you want to hear really Southern, you should have came to Kiss Crusade when old Freckles over there was up here on the stage. Yeah, it's great. Yeehaw! And so, growing up in the South, I love my sweet tea, I love my gravy biscuit, and I love all my good stuff. Hallelujah. We're going to go eat after this. You can't eat yet. You're just getting the spiritual food right now. So, growing up in the South, though, I heard something a lot. I heard, I heard something that people would say. I'm not saying you say it, I'm just saying I've heard it. And it is, before you can get to God, you've got to get sanctified. God's got to clean you up before you can really go to Him. And, and, and I want to flip that just a second. I don't need to get cleaned up before I go to God. I go to God to get cleaned up. You see what I mean? And, 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 and if God's going to use me, then I have to get that in my heart way down deep. That I'm not ever going to be perfect. And if I'm thinking I'm going to be perfect, then I'll never, ever, ever, ever be used by God. Yeah. Because because if I think that my my calling and, and my destiny is predicated on how holy I am and how perfect I am, then I, I might as well just hang it up. Because I'm never going to be holy enough. But thank God when He died, He didn't He didn't die for the perfect people. He didn't come to earth for the perfect folk, the people that had it all together. He died and came to this earth for the people that wasn't perfect, like you and me. That, that's who he came from. That, that, that's, that's why he came. He said, because you're not holy and I am, let me impute some of that to you. <laughs> let me give you a little bit. I, I, I like that God can use us anytime he wants to. <clears throat> I always stay right there, but I keep going. Exodus chapter 4. Now, this is just a chapter over. Now, don't, don't lose me. I got, I got some stuff I got to tell you. Verses 10 through 12. Now, this is, this is after Moses says, Who am I? And you think that Moses is making a little bit of progress. But I'm not thinking he is after this. Verse 10 through 12. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I have never been and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied. Some people said that Moses had a stuttering problem. Some said he just started talking and just started fumbling all over his words. I don't really know what all that means, but he said his words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, I love, he said, who makes a person's mouth? God's so funny. The Bible is really interesting if you just read it. Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear, see or do not see. It is I, <laughs> the Lord. Now go, and I will be with you, 
as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. The issue at hand is when Moses looks and says, I'm not capable of doing what you're telling me to do because of my deficiencies and my weaknesses. I'm not good at speaking. I'm not good. Can I tell you, you're not going to believe me. You don't have to believe me. But when I was in my teenage years, I was pretty shy. All right, now, y'all don't got to chuckle that bad. I really was. And when I was 14, God called me to preach. Next month, uh, I'm sorry, November. I don't know what month I'm in anymore. November will be 16 years I've been preaching. I thought about that this year. And I'm thankful for that. And I give God the praise for that. But the reason I'm telling you is when I was 14 and God told me to, called me to preach, and my dad said, hey, son, would you like to preach on a Sunday night or the church? I said, oh, 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 no, 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 no. Well, son, did you not say God called you to preach? Yeah, but I'm not ready for that. How about just like a little Bible study, you know? And I, I, I remember, I remember my first sermon was on David and Goliath. That's everybody's first sermon, I think. And I, while I was studying, I remember telling God, "I'm going to tell my dad I can't do this. I'm getting ready to tell him downstairs." Hey, Dad. I'm not doing it this Sunday. It was Saturday night. It was great. That would have been great to just tell him then. Hey, Dad, I'm not doing this. And my dad must have heard something from God because he walked up the steps and said, Hey, son, I feel like you're getting ready to tell me you don't want to do this anymore. I was like, maybe my dad really is a mind reader. <laughs> my mom's got eyes in the back of her head. My dad reads my mind, so I'm just hung up. So I said, I said, Dad, how did you know? And he said, because I remember the first time God told me to preach, I didn't want to do it either. He said, but, and he said these words, and they were good. He said, if God put it in you, nobody can take it out of you. And he said, don't allow yourself to get too afraid to not do what God's speaking to you to do. And as I began to study, and God, you know, He gave me the Word, I got up and preached, and, 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 and it all went great, and, you know, I probably, if I listened back to when I was 14 years old, I'd probably critique myself to no end about how I preached and, and all that stuff. It would be probably pretty bad, but I've just learned something over time. And what I've learned is that whenever God commands us and instructs us to do something, whenever we get to a point to where we tell God we can't do it because of our weaknesses, we are minimizing God's strength. Why would we want to do that? Why do we want to minimize the strength that God has? If He's called you, He's ordained you to do what He's called you to do. He's prepared you to do what He wanted you to do. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 9, it says, The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in the mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and, a, and appointed you as a prophet to my nations. Jeremiah says, O oh, sovereign Lord! I can't speak to you. I'm too young. And the Lord said, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. Don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then the Lord reached out and touched his mouth and said, Look, I've put the words in your mouth. If God instructs you to do something, he's already put in you what he wants you to do. You don't have to you don't have to pray for God to put it in you. If He called you, it's already there. <laughs> it's already there. You don't have to work it up. You don't need nobody coming by prophesying over you. Well, God told me to tell you that you're going to be a, a teacher or you're going to be a preacher. Now, that's great confirmation. I'm not downing that at all. God be the glory for prophets and, and prophecies. I'm, I'm not downing that. But I don't need somebody else to tell me that God called me to do what I'm doing. If God said it, that should be the word that I stand on. Because there's going to come a day where somebody's going to tell me, you're not called to do that. And I'm going to say, no, you're wrong. God told me I'm called to do this. And so I'm going to keep walking in it. Because man didn't call me. Man didn't call you. Man didn't save you. Man didn't heal you. It was Jesus that done that. He died for you. He rose from the grave. Not some man. It was a Savior that left the kingdom and came down to this earth and bled and died and said, I'm not going to stay buried in the tomb, but I'm going to move this thing out of my way and I'm going to come walking out. And everybody's going to say, that was the king. That's the king. Not just of the Jews, but that's the king of the world. 
That's the man that I serve. That's the one that called me. That's the one that called you. That's the one that has no limitations. Just as Jeremiah, though, we try to qualify ourselves. <laughs> right? We say, well, we're not qualified to do what, you, what you've told us to do. But I'm going to tell you one more time. Nobody's qualified to do anything. Well, you didn't, you didn't go to college for that. Ain't nothing wrong with going to college. Young people go to college. Go to college. But you don't need college to tell you what God has told you to do. Go to college. But that shouldn't be what qualifies you to do what God's instructed you to do. You don't need the approval of a man. You don't need the approval of a woman. You don't need somebody saying, you're awesome and you can do this. And, and it's good to have encouragers. But, but if nobody ever encouraged you, don't let Satan discourage you because nobody else is encouraging you. Because God said, I'll put my spirit in you. And that should be all the encouragement that you need. Because when people say no, I'll say yes. When people leave you, I'll stay. When people say you can't do it, I'll say you can do it through my strength and through my power. Because I don't have no limitations. I don't have no limitations. We get afraid if we step out in faith. And sometimes we think that God won't live up to His end of the bargain. He won't do what He said He'll do. I, I, you can begin to talk. I, while He's getting ready, I, I want to I tell you this real quickly. There's a lesson I had have, I have to learn kind of young. And I remember praying for this person. I was about 17, 18 ish. I remember praying for this lady, and she come up. She had back problems, and she walked up to the altar like this. It's all she could do to get up there. And so I laid my hand on her back, and, and some people gathered around her, and we prayed that God would heal her. And I really felt I when I say I felt the spirit of the Lord, I felt Him really strong while we were praying. You ever done that? Felt the Lord so strong, you just it's like you just feel like a power went through your body and went through everybody else's. And that woman, she said, Hallelujah. And she walked back. And we thought, she's got to be healed. And she walked back out. And she's still doing this. Walking out. I went home that night and I said, God, am, am, I, am I faithless in my prayers? Was there something that I, that I prayed wrong that I didn't, I didn't believe enough? And Jesus, it's kind of like I feel. Sometimes, have you ever felt the Lord's arms just wrap around you? I, 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 I don't know how to explain that other than you just feel something come across your body, and it just wraps around you. And I, I felt it just. He said, "Spirit spoke to me and said, your thinking is not mine." Your ways are not mine. And he spoke this one word to me at the end. That, uh, it's, it's like I've, I've, I've never forgotten. He said, don't ever put your faith in your prayer. And I thought, in my prayer. He said, put your faith and the one who can answer the prayer, not the prayer. Because anybody can say what they want to say. You can get up and pray a good prayer. You know what I mean? We could have we could have everybody say a prayer and all of us could say a really powerful prayer to the ear. But it's not about how you say it. It's about what you believe when you're saying it. And so I left that my, my upstairs room, and I went up, went back over the church. We lived beside the church, and I just fell on my face. And God spoke to me and said, "Pray for that woman. Pray for that woman that you prayed for tonight. Pray for her again." And all I knew to say, I started praying, and I didn't have word. I didn't have a lot of words. I I wouldn't say. I wasn't quoting scripture or anything like that. I wasn't saying, by the blood of Jesus and all these 
these terms, I'm not saying that's wrong, by the way. I'm just saying I, I wasn't, nothing was coming out. But all I could get out of my mouth was Jesus. That's all I could get out. I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then tears started to Jesus, Jesus. And I stood up on my feet. I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I did that for probably 30 minutes. And I went back home, and the phone rang. And I'm not making this up. And the lady called my dad and said, I was sitting in my, on my couch in my living room, and I felt something come over my body. And she said, that prayer we prayed tonight must have just now kicked in. And my dad started going, hallelujah. And he was, he was praising the Lord on the phone. And, to God be the glory. And, and he called me down. I went upstairs and he called me back down the steps. He said, son, i got to tell you something. I said, what's that? He called her name and he said, she was sitting on her couch. And just about five minutes ago, she felt the power of God. And I didn't do anything. I just got down on my knees. And I said, Jesus! Jesus! And you know what the Lord spoke to me and said? It's not by your prayer. It's through me that all get healed. And when you say the name Jesus, that's the name that saved you. Jesus is the name that will heal you. Jesus is the peace that gives your body. Jesus is strength. Jesus is power. Jesus is everything you need. Sometimes you're not going to have all the perfect speech. And you might not have all the great words. And Oh, i got to say the perfect prayer. All you might be able to say is get on your knees and say, Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I need you. Oh, Jesus. And he's going to know what you need. It's Jesus. At the name Jesus, one day every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. The ones that aren't bowing now are going to bow one day. The ones that deny Him are going to bow one day. The ones that talk bad about Him are going to bow one day. Satan's going to get down on his knees one day. And by the blood of Jesus, every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is holy. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. Jesus. 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 You need help in your life? Quit calling up your buddy and just say, Jesus! Because he has no limitations. There's nothing that limits him. Nothing that limits him. Nothing that limits him. i got to show you one more thing. Come on. Just stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. I'm almost done. Uh, look at Exodus 3, 13 and 14. I've got to show you one more scripture. It says, Moses protested, said, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? When they ask me, What is the God's name that sent you? What is his name? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people that I am has sent you. Moses is looking, thinking, how, how are these people going to respond to me? How are these people going to listen to what I've got to say? He said, who am I supposed to tell them you are? When they say, who sent you, Moses? What are you going to, what are you going to, what am I going to tell them? And God says, you don't have to tell them all the things that I can do. Just tell them. I am who I am is the one that sent me. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it means this. That God didn't have to tell everybody he was the healer and he was he was he was the Alpha and Omega and he he was all this. He didn't have to tell them all these things. He just said, I am. What does I am mean? It means that I'm everything from the beginning, the middle, and the end. 
I can do anything above what you can think, anything you you can imagine that I can do, I can do it. I can do more than you can think. I will do more than you think I can do. I'll control the wind and waves if I have to. I'll walk on the water if I've got to. I'll raise a dead man from the grave if I've got to. I'll heal a blinded eye. I'll do whatever i got to do. I'll pick you up out of the pit. I'll wash your back off. I'll wash your feet. I'll do whatever I've got to do. I am who I am. I'm everything and all in between. I can do it all. I am is the one that sent me. I am. Well, God, I'm just not qualified. God, I just can't do it. God, I can't pray for that person. God, I just don't have everything I need. God, I can't do it. The next time you don't think God can use you, let me just read something to you. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was too afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were way too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while they were praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was dead. But if God can use all of them, God can use all of you. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet today. He can use you. There's nothing that he can't do. He can do whatever He wants to do. Well, we're not holy enough. We don't have it all together. We're never going to be holy enough. And we're never going to have it all together. So quit judging yourself based on what you think. Who cares what you think? Let God be the judge of your life. Let God use you for what He wants to use you for. You wasn't qualified when you came to Him. Because God don't. He don't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. He doesn't need you to tell him what he can do. You just need to trust him. Let him put the words in your mouth. Let him touch you. Let him, let him heal you. Let him use you. Come on, bow your heads with me today. God has no limits. So why do we limit God? My outer call is so simple. But but some of you aren't going to respond for some reason. And the outer call is so simple as this. That if you want to take the limitations off God in your situations, I want you to come down here and stand in the altar. That's all I want you to do. Come on. If you want to take the limitations off of God in your circumstances, why don't you come? I want you to stand. I, want, I don't want you to kneel. I want you to stand. I want you to stand. And when you get down here, don't come with limitations in your mind, because when you do, you're already limiting God. Well, I don't know what, what God, I don't know. It doesn't matter. No limits. No boundaries. God has no limits. God can show up in the middle of the desert and give you water. Come on, anybody else? Anybody? Anybody else? Come on, come on. Anybody else? Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep coming, keep coming. Find a place. Find a place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to do something, and, and, and hopefully you won't be uncomfortable doing this. All I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to close your eyes if you're down the altar. And if you're, if you're not comfortable doing this, you don't have to. But the reason I want you to do this is because it's a surrenderance to God to say there's no limitations. So I want you to lift up your hands if you feel comfortable. If you don't, you don't have to do that. I don't want to make you do anything you don't want to do. But we're saying no limitations, God, to all of your situations. All your problems right here on the altar. 
We are not going to limit God by what we can see through our scope of life anymore. Even if we can't see God doing it, that means He can't do it. And I want you to pray. I'm going to try to lay hands on all of you and just agree with you. There's no power in me. I'm just a man. I'm just going to agree with you. That's our God. And, and I just want to agree that you're going to see God do that great thing that you've been praying about. Cool. As they start singing, I want you to begin to pray right now about your situation. Begin to seek God. If you can't do nothing, just say Jesus. Because that's, 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 all the, that's all you need. Just start speaking the name Jesus just before we go. Just say Jesus. 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 Precious Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. The power is in Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's no limits in the name of Jesus. Jesus, 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 Never changed. The same God you read about, I am. The same God that parted the waters, I am He. The same God that raised Lazarus from the dead, I am He. I am He who saved you. I am He who will come again for you. I am He who has this world in the palm of my hand, and I am He who is not taken by surprise. I am Jehovah. I am the Alpha and Omega. I will be here when this thing all boils down to an end. I will stand with you. You stand with me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Others will will walk out on you, but I won't, saith the Lord. I'm going to do one more thing and then I'm going to let you go. Just bow your heads with me one more time. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. If you're here today and you need to get things together and just make your life right, you can just need to say, forgive me, Lord, let me turn around. I want to go the right way. I've been messing up. It's time to turn around. And then real quick, but nobody looking, slip your hand up. I'm not going to call you out. Just slip your hand up real fast. Yep. Somebody else. Somebody else. Yep. Come on. Anybody else? I need to turn it around. Come on, there's somebody else, somebody else. I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. Yep, I see your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I pray for these people that lifted their hands that say, I need to get it right, turn it around. I need to turn it around. I pray that you would go to where they're at right now as they're asking for forgiveness, as they're asking to repent, which means to turn. They turn from the direction that they're walking now, and they turn and go the opposite way, which is toward you. Renew them, refill them, restore them. And it's in the name Jesus that's that that's the in the, it's the blood of Jesus that's covered their sins. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give him another hand clap of praise today? For all of his goodness and all of his you on your way out. Don't forget to give them the tithe and offering on your way out. The box is right on the left side back there, okay? If you're visiting with us, please fill out one of those cards and let us get you a gift before you leave. And I'd love to meet you. I'm going to be up here on the stage. I'd love to meet you before you go, okay? Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you that you're awesome. Thank you, Lord, that you are merciful and gracious. Thank you that you heal. Thank you that you restore. Thank you that you didn't stay in the ground, but you rose. I thank you that you're powerful and you're omnipotent. We thank you, God, that you are in control of our life, and we say no limits to our God, no limits in our situations. Bless us, Lord. Let us walk renewed. Let us walk in that no limit mentality. We claim it, we receive it, we stand on it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen.